Karen Harkey, Commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events in Chicago. Significant parts of Chicago's history and future are present in this landmark building, the Chicago Cultural Center. Parts of this history in this building are the Grand Army of the Republic, Memorial Hall, and Rotunda. Throughout the years, the rooms have been used for public ceremonies, private events, and music and dance performances. A generous grant made it possible to do a museum quality restoration of the space. Harbo Architects and a team of the absolute top talent in historic restoration have revived the Grand Army of the Republic Memorial Hall and Rotunda. Specialized experts in preservation have restored the beauty of the Rotunda's stained glass dome as well as the artistry of the fixtures and walls to the way they looked in 1898. The Grand Army of the Republic uh, Memorial Hall and Rotunda are, are so important to Chicago's history and to the history of our nation. So first of all, the Grand Army of the Republic was uh, a fraternal organization. It was the Civil War veterans. After the Civil War, uh, think of it as the American Legion. It had, it had a very vibrant Grand Army of the Republic uh, 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 organization. They were headquartered in the Dearborn Park, right here, where which finally built was the Cultural Center. So when the Cultural Center was built as the public library, they also brought in the Grand Army of the Republic. So in its early days, filled with Civil War veterans, over time it became more of a museum as Civil War veterans were no longer with us. But I think of it now as a monument to the defeat of the slaveocracy. So especially in Memorial Hall, you see all of those battles that the Union Army won engraved in the green marble. Um, this is a memorial that's been forgotten over time that's going to be restored with meaning. This is a Tiffany masterpiece sort of lost in time. And so these, these rooms whitewashed, there's, there's no color. The, Healy Malay uh, glass dome has lost its, its vitality and it's all going to be restored and it's going to be as powerful as, as the Preston Bradley Hall, a, a second Tiffany masterpiece in this building. We will have two Tiffany masterpieces each which will just, you go into these rooms and your jaw drops and you're in awe and you're, you're feeling the power of these, these beautiful civic spaces. There is nothing new about restoring historic interiors. People have been doing it for years. But when it comes to restoring the rooms of the Grand Army of the Republic, that's a whole different story altogether. So there was plenty that was new about restoring the Grand Army of the Republic rooms. The design of the rooms Charles A. Coolidge of the distinguished Boston firm of Shepley, Rutan, and Coolidge. You have people who did the original finishes with names like Tiffany, also leaded glass. The colors were worked out by the architects and Tiffany and executed by one of the great leaded glass firms of Chicago, Healy and Millay. In the 1970s, it was decided that this looked old fashioned. So what happened? Those beautiful finishes were covered up with a bland coating of a grayish paint. And so the craftsmanship from back years ago needs to not only be recognized, but those original surfaces need to be restored. In terms of recovering Tiffany's colors, that was kind of a interesting surprise. This was no ordinary painted finish where you take a paintbrush and you just put a coat of paint on something. The colors were applied to the walls like you would in a fine painting. Multiple thin layers, one on top of each other, all hand rubbed by the craftspeople. Some of the layers were metallic. All would then blend together as one rich, deep, surfaces. Transitions between colors were ones that were subtle and one led to the other and helped draw your eye across the spaces and really stir your senses. 
A nice discovery was made that never happens in historic preservation in that when original finishes are painted over, you normally can never get that later paint off and restore the original finish or recover it. A discovery was made in this case that you were able to take a very thin blade and chip by chip you could remove the later layers of paint. The challenge is to bring this all back. Typically, when you're going to restore a space, you find out what the original colors and the finishes are, and you replicate them. Well, not in this case. Basically, what you're doing here is digging through to find the original layers and bringing them back, the original finishes. It's just like searching for buried treasure. And it's worth doing because you want to see the hand of the craftspeople who did this work originally. During the actual, um, when the construction started, uh, was actually during COVID and it ended up being a little bit to our advantage because the building was closed. So um, Berglund and, and Hardware Architects really kind of had free reign of the building. So they were able to bring everything in, set things up without having to encounter um, anything else going on in the building. A lot of what I do is to coordinate um, staff, the public, and any event that happens in the building. So as we began to reopen, that's when I really needed to play a more integral role to make sure that I was working every day with these different entities to make sure that you know we're, we're scheduling things appropriately, that projects that they're doing don't overlap or interfere with different events or activities that are taking place throughout the building. The overall uh, people that partnered with us um, uh, Harbo Architects, Berglund have been absolutely fantastic and they're such professionals in what they do that it has been so easy to work with them. I cannot wait for someone to walk into GAR once it's complete. Whether you've been there a uh, hundred times and walked through or whether you're a visitor of Chicago and coming in for the first time, the first thing you're really going to notice is visually how, how spectacular it's going to be. From the dome, from the stained glass actually being cleaned, it's going to be clearer, and from the natural sunlight that's going to be coming in. The entire experience going through these spaces is going to be different than what you've ever expected before. Uh, my first thoughts when we were asked to participate in this fabulous project was I couldn't believe it. My great-grandfather had served in the Civil War. I had inherited his GAR pin. So I was very excited. After 30 years of doing restoration work, this is going to be one of the greatest projects we've been involved with. The scope of the project is, is pretty direct in, in many ways, but it's very complicated in its execution. Uh, but primarily it's interior finishes, and uh, it's, it's a really unique project in the sense that we've never been involved where we're actually restoring, conserving original paint finishes. Usually you strip paint and replace it with new paint and so on. And in this case, we're actually able to conserve much of the original paint surfaces, so that's very exciting and very unusual. The scope of the product is, is all the interior finishes of the three main rooms that we're working on, the GAR hall, the, uh, the, the entry hall, and then of course the dome room or the rotunda. Um, and the, so the paint finishes are a big deal. All of the doors are being restored, so they've been removed off-site. They're being repaired because there's places where wood has been chipped off and so on. And then they will all be refinished to match like they were originally because over the years they've been mismatched in their restorations or, or previous restorations, we could say. Um, and the other big thing, there's a whole bunch of people that are working on the replica finishes that we're manufacturing. That's another big component of the project is ma making new finishes that have long been gone. Uh, so many, many people, I, I don't know the exact number, but dozens. 
we were able to do investigation and that includes both in situ or here in the in the building as well as laboratory analysis to do cross sections it's basically like looking at an archaeological dig where you see all the various layers of the treatments of the paint and um, and then doing some trials the mock-ups is key to everything we do and particularly in this case where we were actually able to uh, do attempts at seeing what would work and we found out that um, we were actually able to remove the overburdened paint, the later paint that was put on, and then conserve the surfaces of the original paint and that that would be successful. That was really exciting because, uh, as I said, we've never been able to do that in a project before. When we talk about conserving the original paint finishes, um, what we're talking about is all the, 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 the highlighted elements, that's an aluminum leaf, so a metal leaf that was applied and then there are uh, different kinds of, of, of uh, varnish put on it, sometimes tinted and so on, to give an overall effect of something that looks like metal. That was the idea. And all the gray or, or beigey color you see, that's all overburdened paint that was put on in the 1970s and that's being carefully removed. You see a little bit further over there, you see the red paint that was underneath. That's the original paint finishes. And they are able to actually scrape away the overburdened paint using a small X-Acto knife. So it's quite laborious. I'm sure you, you can uh, see them actually doing that. And then in this more intricate work in here between the, um, between the leaves, in these areas here, in these areas here, they're using um, uh, a chemical acetone with uh, little cotton swabs or cotton pads and they're able to remove that overburdened paint, which is fantastic. I mean, it's a really amazing process to see them be able to do that. In addition to all the finishes, which is going to completely blow people's minds to see what this space looked like when it was originally done, uh, and that's exactly what it's gonna look like when we are done. The upgrades are, we're upgrading the lighting, so we're using replicated light fixtures, which will be um, giving much better lighting than we've had here in decades. Um, we are going to replace the tinted glass that was put in in the windows in the 70s as well, so we'll go back to the original clear glass. So from the outside at night, you'll get this beautiful glow of what's going on in the space. Um, we're also upgrading uh, how the mechanical system works, so we're not really changing that too much, but the distribution will change because there's some areas, like in the corner there, you see uh, that that's an old louver. That one's staying, but many of the other ones that are more intrusive, those are gonna be removed so we don't see the ugly uh, mechanical system that we don't, architects never like to see. Um, at the other end of the hall, there's a bunch of places there where we're actually able to remove those louvers and use a different distribution system so that we won't see that anymore. The scope of this project is a top to bottom restoration and preservation of the GAR rooms inside of the cultural center. Um, the real gem of it is the stained glass dome inside of the rotunda. And what a lot of people don't know is that there was artificial light coming through that stained glass dome originally. Uh, there was a concrete cap that sat over the stained glass dome. We're, we've removed the cap. We took that apart and it's being restored fully. Um, 50,000 pieces about uh, that are being taken apart, put back together. And we're gonna put a new skylight in so that natural light is gonna come back in uh, through the stained glass. We're extremely honored to work on such a project that has such a notoriety throughout Chicagoland. Within, within this process, we have about 30 people that are involved in this process day to day, from the cleaning, from the architectural rubbings, rebuilding the windows, then we have to re-cement them, put rebars on it, so there's probably five or six different groups that will be working within our organization here to start the windows and complete them. The challenges of this project have been twofold. One is the removal. Um, taking out such a large piece, it was a 40-foot diameter uh, dome window, 
it was hard to take that out and not break any additional pieces. So the removal was one part that was extremely difficult. The other is finding the glass that matches the existing glass so that whatever pieces were broken, we could replace those with glass that matched exactly. So to match the glass, uh, we're extremely lucky that there's a company in Chicago, Ed Hoyes, that has uh, the largest glass selection throughout the country. So we, we took many hours going over there and looking for an exact match of the glass. The glass that we couldn't match exactly, we've done some layering to get the effect that we need. So down below, normal persons looking up there, they see the color that we needed to match, but it might be layered two or three times uh, to get accomplished that. So our, our process is pretty much the first thing we do when we bring the, 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 the panel in the stained glass is we do a rubbing of that and that's an architectural rubbing that shows the existing glass. It's like a large puzzle. Once we do the rubbing, then we physically soak the stained glass window in a, a, a substance of Orvis, which is a soap, and then we dismantle it piece by piece and put it on another rubbing that actually acts as the puzzle piece of that. Once it's cleaned, we determine what pieces are broke. If it can be edge glued, we edge glue uh, a piece together. If it needs a little bit more than edge gluing, then we replace it with the replacement, replacement piece of glass that we've already found. From there, we put it on the table. We have a mold made of the, the diameter of the window, and then we fabricate the window on top of the mold so that we get the exact circumference back built to that dome. This is such an interesting dome. I have not had the opportunity to work on helium Malay glass before, which is great. Um, they were an important studio here in Chicago, and, and I'm very into Chicago glass. And it, it, this dome definitely ranks up there among the, the great projects of my career. So I, I'm very excited to be working on it. Um, the, the amount of dirt and the uh, concrete dome above it cut so much light to it that it really kind of looked just like a, a muddy amber brown color. Helium Malay has been gone for years, but um, replacement glass um, is still made. People are still making stained glass windows, so there are still companies making stained glass. In one case here, we actually have to put two colors together to get the color we need, and that, that's also doable. One of the things that we discussed today with Julie Sloan was the restoration of the dome window at the flowers. Each one of the flowers tended to bow up inside of the dome, and that was mostly from heat buildup. So in the restoration, we would like to accomplish or, or try to stop that from happening. So what we talked about doing was setting up a, a rebar aligned with the outside of the flower. And then we're gonna add another little bar to each one of the flowers that's gonna bend around the flowers and you're gonna get soldered to this bar so that will prevent the window and the flower areas from bowing up into this top of the dome. It was built extremely well and it did have rebars on it to hold it at particular locations. And we're just gonna add a couple more rebars and supports so that it will last another 100 years. So just by adding those bars, it will take out a lot of the um, bowing issues that we had before. You know, we've got uh, eight sections of the window and we've basically, as of today, finished two of those sections. So we have six more sections to do of rebuilding just like this. The two top people in, 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 in the country is Julie Sloan and then also Bob Score working on this, restoration architect and stained glass consultant. Because I think it'll be easier if we just come back to the single bar. Um, Berglund's been great. We've worked with them in the past. And then, again, our team here is well capable of restoring a, a dome like this. It's just taken a lot of time. One of the, the most difficult features in it is the fact that every panel is curved. Instead of just being able to handle and, and build the sections on a flat table, we have to have curved forms to transport it and to build it on because if it, if it flattens out on its own, we run the risk of breaking glass. So we have to keep it in that curved shape to transport it when it came out of the uh, 
the room. It had to go on to curved forms to be transported to the studio. In the studio, when they are ready to rebuild them, they, they have built forms that they will uh, rebuild the sections on to solder because it has to be in that curved form to go back into the building. And the sections are so large. Uh, some of the sections are nine feet wide. Um, that's, that, that's a massive undertaking. It's hard to handle a nine foot panel that's flat but having to deal with it in, in the curvature shape as well is, is tricky. In order to repair broken glass, because this is a, a skylight and it's, it will be above people's heads, we have to replace more glass than we normally would in a window. So pieces that uh, have only a single crack or have cracks that are held on at least half the sides by the, the lead cane that surrounds each piece. Those can be glued. Anna? Yeah. So they kind of learned all the little, and everything was pretty consistent with what was needed to be yeah. adjusted a little bit. And we're using epoxies on silicones to glue those. Anything that could risk losing a piece of glass eventually if the glue fails, um, it, those pieces are being replaced. When, when it's naturally lit, it's going to be spectacular. In, just in cleaning the glass and looking at it on a, on a bench where there's no light coming through it, we can see so much more color. All right, how's that look? You okay? Good, yeah, yeah. It has bright pink in it, it has blue in it, colors that, that nobody would realize. You could see them in the Oculus that had been restored a number of years ago. Um, and the Oculus stood out oddly because it was so much brighter than the, the rest of the dome. The rest of the dome is going to look like the Oculus and it's just going to knock people's socks off. It's, it's just going to be so beautiful. Light plays an important part on how these rooms work. The natural light that comes through the dome, which then illuminates the space below through the beautiful colored leaded glass panels. But also the light that comes from the newly restored bronze and glass light fixtures, because the colors of the room themselves were actually created in mind with what the light level and color was of light bulbs back in the 1890s. Arc Historic has been in business for 98 years and we've done restorations all of that time. We are mostly uh, devoted to building new uh, custom and semi-custom lighting for commercial use but we still uh, do restorations. So the lighting designer and the architect did a lot of upfront work to help us understand what the lights originally looked like. So once we have in some initial sketches and understanding of what the fixtures really look like in detail, we go to uh, a 2D CAD representation, and that's when we blow out all the parts and understand how the fixtures are going to go together. Uh, from there, we go to a 3D model, and at that point, it's all 3D uh, digital workflow from there out. So we do a full 3D model, and then from there we go to uh, 3D prints of the parts, and those are used as patterns for the foundry to actually make the bronze components. So these are replica fixtures based on the original draw, uh, photographs that we have. Yeah, so the way that the fixtures are constructed is uh, we use bronze castings for the bulk of the component parts, um, there are some components that are made from um, extrusions or other, uh, other, par other types of uh, materials, and those are, for the most part, solid brass. So we are uh, producing uh, lighting for the GAR restoration, including chandeliers, ceiling flush mount lights, and also wall sconces. The number of chandeliers in total is 10, and there are three variations on the chandelier. There's a nine arm, a 10 arm, and a 15 arm chandelier. The reason there's uh, different types of chandeliers is that the original designers felt like there needed to be a variation within the large gar room. So there are 
the, the large 15 arm chandelier is surrounded by smaller chandeliers. And then also in the entryway, there is the small uh, nine arm chandelier. So the wall sconces are unique in that they are a fairly large format and they have a number of uh, arms, 10 arms, uh, that uh, have a confluence into a relatively small back plate. So it's a really interesting design, uh, a, a challenge to manufacture this type of design just because you're working with uh, fairly long arms going into a small space. So the length of time for this type of project, we typically allot a, li a little over a year and we worked within a compressed time frame uh, for this project, which was uh, a goal to uh, compress it down to around seven months. Woodwork is an important element in the room, and there was a combination of oak and mahogany. You hardly could get an idea of how large these doors were until they were taken off their hinges and now will blend in beautifully with the decorative finishes of the surrounding marbles, glass, and plasterwork. One of the things that really makes the Grand Army of the Republic rooms work are the things that aren't the tangible, solid things. And so it's a sense of space as you walk through and see how the changing ceiling heights will impact you from one to the other. So everything is being put back in sync, both the physical reality, but also the things that you don't see, but things that you can feel.